morning and welcome to Calvary's online worship service. I'm Bree and I'm glad you guys can join us this morning. To take the next steps, you can go to calvarychurchwalker.org and click on the tab. Either get connected, get serving, or join a small group. Now I'm going to hand it over to the worship team. Well, good morning, Calvary. My name is Janie and I'll be leading worship for you this morning. But before we open with our first song, I want to read a passage from Scripture. Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I just wanted to encourage you guys this morning as we open and worship with the song Valley that no matter where you are, if you're on the mountaintops of life right now or in the valleys, that God is just as close.
offering. And if you'd like to give, you can go to calvarychurchwalker.org and click on the give tab. Lord, just pray that you will bless us all this coming week as you always do. And may your love be present um, even through the hard times and the good times. You're always there. And sometimes it's hard to see that. Um, I pray that you will just be present and um, our hearts will be full of joy. And thank you for this beautiful weather and your grace. In your name we pray. Amen.
Hey, good morning, Calvary. Thanks for being with us for today's online service. If you have a Bible, would you go on ahead and open up to the early part of your Old Testament in a little book called Ruth, and it's wedged between Judges and First and Second Samuel. We're in a series called A Journey from uh, Heartache to Hope, and in it we find the twists and turns of this small family who had suffered great losses. Um, they had come from Israel originally, uh, Naomi and her husband and sons had migrated to Moab, which was Israel's enemy. They had gone there in search of food, but while they were there, her husband died, both her sons died, and she ended up with two young widows for daughters-in-law, desperate poverty, and needed to relocate back to Israel. But in that time of great loss, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, showed remarkable faithful commitment to her and ultimately to relocate to Israel and to come under the protection of Israel's God. So that's where we're at today in chapter 3, and I want you to turn there in your Bible. So today we find a very unusual marriage proposal in chapter 3. And usually we expect marriage proposals to go smoothly, have lots of smiles, and plenty of pictures later. But sometimes things don't go according to plan. Uh, that's what happened to Jonathan, who was a 28-year-old baseball fan. He was in love with his girl, he bought a couple baseball tickets, and he paid the fee to have Marry Me Sarah put up on the Jumbotron during the game, expecting the cameras to turn to he and his girlfriend as he pulled out the ring. But he was told the Jumbotron would have their message up in the fourth and fifth inning. Well, guess what happened? Third inning comes, and Sarah has to go use the restroom, and while she's out at the ladies' room, Marry Me Sarah flashes on the screen, People go nuts, and the camera turns to Jonathan, who's sitting very much alone, looking like a bachelor. Things also went wrong for Leah Ann of South Dakota. Her boyfriend decided to propose to her on a cold, windy day out on a South Dakota lake. Unfortunately, it was his first trip ever in this little boat, and when they got out into the lake, the motor died, and they spent two hours adrift in rough water in the cold before they were rescued. Not exactly the romantic outing you'd hope for. Things also went wrong for Albert Nadru of Sheffield, England. He was expecting to propose to Valerie in a romantic setting of their apartment, which he had decorated with 60 balloons scattered across the floor and 100 candles that spelled out, Marry Me. So, <clears throat> Albert decided to light all the candles and go pick up his girlfriend and bring her to the apartment. And when they got back, the whole apartment was in flames. So none of those scenarios worked out as planned, but all those scenarios worked out. Each said yes to the marriage proposal, and each couple ended up married. <coughs> well, from chapter one, not much in Naomi and Ruth's life had gone according to their plan. They lived in difficult times, They'd experienced famine, uh, both had experienced relocation, both had experienced widowhood, both were in dire poverty. And yet, God was not done with their story. So we're in chapter 3, Ruth, and I invite you to read along. So one day Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight he'll be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now do as I tell you. Take a bath, put on perfume, and dress in your best clothes. Then go to the threshing floor and don't let Boaz see you until he's finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. After Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was startled to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. <coughs> I'm your servant Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner 
of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz exclaimed. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before, for you have not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. Now don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary, for everyone in town knows you are a virtuous woman. But while it's true that I am one of your family redeemers, there is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning I will talk to him. If he is willing to redeem you, very well. Let him marry you. But if he is not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lay down here until morning. So Ruth lay at Boaz's feet until the morning, but she got up before it was light enough for people to recognize each other. For Boaz had said, no one must know that a woman was here at the threshing floor. And then Boaz said to her, bring your cloak and spread it out. He measured six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back, and then he returned to the town. When Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, what happened, my daughter? And Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her. And she added, he gave me these six scoops of barley and said, don't, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said to her, just be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens. The man won't rest until he's settled things today. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for the beauty of the harvest time and for what this means is happening on farms and crops all over our country, Lord. Uh, we pray for safety for those who are out in the fields and that their productive would be, um, that they would have a productive harvest season. Lord, we pray for uh, kids and parents and teachers and coaches and drivers who are doing everything they need to start kids out on a new school year. We pray for your encouragement and strength and wisdom for all of them and the demands of all that. And Lord, we pray for our church. Uh, you know our needs. You know the struggles that each of our family deals with. And I pray, Lord God, that in the middle of what's going on in life, we would know that you are right here in the middle of it with us working out your plans for good. So I pray, Lord God, that as we go through Ruth and Naomi's story today, uh, you would use it uh, to feed our spirit as we walk through our own walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so God has a plan, and we don't always know what he's up to. But just because God has a plan does not mean that we don't make plans. And just because God is ultimately in charge of everything doesn't mean that we don't take action, show initiative, and um, sometimes take risks. <clears throat> After Naomi saw how the Lord had been providing for her and Ruth by Ruth uh, ending up in the field of Moaz, as it happened, and by Boaz's generous uh, provision and protection for her, she saw God's hand at work in their lives, meeting their needs, and she began to get her mojo back. <coughs> but as the harvest ended two months along and the threshing was beginning, Naomi saw a need to solve a bigger problem than what they were going to eat next. It was time to find Ruth a husband, a family, a home, a source of security for her future that Naomi could not provide on her own. Now, a threshing floor was typically a wide open stone area that would be positioned where the daytime winds would blow across it and they would lay down the grain, they would trample it to pieces and then throw it into the air with forks. And what that would do is allow the wind to carry away the chaff and the straw and leave the grain behind to be collected. So if you've ever been around a farm at harvest time, you know it's a lot of work and it's long days, and that was surely the case for these folks as they're in the time of threshing after harvest. <clears throat> but it's also an exciting time, a happy time, because that's a time when you see the product of all your year's labors come together and get gathered into the barn. So <clears throat> Naomi has a problem. Uh, how does she get Ruth in front of uh, Boaz given the social differences between them, which are huge? Uh, remember, this is over 3,000 years ago, <coughs> and um, 
a woman in those circumstances can't just walk up to a man and say, hey, can we go get coffee? Or can I give you a phone call? Or hey, are you interested in a relationship? That's not how their society works. Uh, everything in their community has them socially separated. So Boaz is Israelite and Ruth is a Moabite, which puts her an outsider and a foreigner. Uh, Boaz is uh, older and Ruth is very young. And so in that culture, you show a lot of deference uh, in terms of age. He is a wealthy, influential community leader. Uh, Ruth is a poor outsider. So this is not a situation where Naomi or Ruth can just walk up to Boaz and initiate a conversation that might turn into a relationship. That's not how it works. <coughs> so Naomi comes up with this uh, pretty amazing, pretty radical plan um, to see if it's God's will for this whole relationship to move forward in a permanent direction. So she tells Ruth, bathe, uh, put on your anointing oil or perfume, change clothes. And in our context, that might look like getting all dialed up to be attractive. And that was surely part of it. But there's probably more going on here. Uh, those are the actions, the exact words that are spoken of of King David when he lost a son. When he left the time of mourning and grief, 2 Samuel 12 says that he bathed and he perfumed himself and he changed clothes. And what King David did in 2 Samuel and what Ruth is doing here is giving public testimony that her season of mourning and grief is done. Typically in those days when somebody died, a family member, particularly a spouse, would have a time of mourning during which they would be um, relationally unavailable to pursue anything else. And by telling her to change clothes, bathe, and perfume, Naomi is telling Ruth, it's time to hang out the available sign that you are ready for a new relationship, a new marriage. <coughs> so Naomi tells Ruth not just to change her outfit and uh, take a bath, she tells her to go arrange to meet Boaz in privacy, in secrecy, all alone in the middle of the night. Now, I'm just going to tell you, socially, this is a pretty high-risk move. This is a gamble because you can't know in advance how Boaz is going to react. She tells her to uncover his feet in the night when she arrives. Eventually, he's going to wake up and she will be there and they will have this private opportunity to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Well, <clears throat> Ruth follows through. She's got a bold faith. She is loyal to Naomi. She is willing to cooperate. She's come to know that Boaz is an honorable man. And uh, when Boaz wakes up, Ruth goes one better than Naomi's instruction to just do whatever he tells you. This is what happens in verse 9. Boaz wakes up. It's so dark he doesn't even recognize her. He says, who are you? And she replies, it's Ruth, your servant. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. Now, this bold request is about a lot more than keeping warm on a chilly night. Uh, it is the custom in those times of how a man would publicly demonstrate his intent desire to marry a woman. Again, typically in those days, marriage was not so much a romantic union of two individuals, but a contractual, almost business arrangement of two families. But in this case, there's been no family arrangement. Also in those days, it would be expected that the man would initiate, the older would initiate, and that if a, an Israelite was going to marry a foreigner, which typically was discouraged or banned altogether, it would certainly be the Israelite who would take the initiative. <coughs> In this case, all of that is backwards and upside down. Ruth is younger, Ruth is a woman, Ruth is poor, and Ruth is a Moabite. And Ruth says, in essence, I want you to marry me. And in marrying her, 
not only is this going to be a union between them as man and his wife, but it's got family implications because she is reminding him, you're my family redeemer. In other words, my mother-in-law is at risk. Our family property is at risk. And I need you to not only marry me, but redeem that which has come to me by way of marriage and family. <coughs> so this is really a huge gamble. Uh, Ruth cannot guess in advance how Boaz is going to respond. If he rejects her, she will be humiliated for the rest of her life in a very small community. Likewise, Naomi has everything riding on this. If this goes wrong, there's no plan B. And she and her Moabite daughter-in-law would be outcasts in their own hometown if this goes haywire. And Boaz, well, if word gets out that he's been meeting women in the dark of night out at a threshing floor, people are going to assume the worst. Of Ruth, <clears throat> at a minimum, she'd be humiliated. At worst, she could be accused of prostitution. And Boaz's reputation would be in shambles. <clears throat> so how does Boaz respond? He says, the Lord bless you, my daughter. In other words, may the Lord our God do good to you. Now, don't get weirded out by the word daughter. In those days, as a, a term of family endearment and affection. And um, so don't let that you know, seem strange to you. That's the way they spoke back then in terms of endearment. <clears throat> but in calling her daughter, he is expressing a warmth and a desire to see God do good to her. And then look at what he says. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before, for you've not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. <clears throat> now that word um, family loyalty, that's that same little Hebrew word we've talked about every week, hased. Uh, it can be translated kindness or faithful love or loyal love or commitment. Uh, it's everything that is positive in a loving, committed relationship that you would want to have from another human being and that ultimately we need from God himself. So that word keeps coming back and back and back. And uh, Boaz simply says, this is a bigger show of faithful love than even what you did before taking care of your mother-in-law. Because Ruth could have had other options. She could have looked for marriage elsewhere. There were other prospects available. But if she would have chosen somebody else or if she would have uh, allowed herself to be pursued by someone else and accepted another marriage, Naomi would have been left hung out to dry in terms of being a widow without family. And the family property and the family uh, destiny of descendants, all of that would have been erased. So by Ruth taking the initiative here to essentially ask Boaz to marry her, she is not only being uh, kind to Boaz, who's not a spring chicken anymore, but she is being kind to the whole family and their lives and that family history is going to be changed because of Ruth's faithful loyalty. Which brings us back to this term, uh, family redeemer. Uh, your Bible might say kinsman redeemer. It's a relative who's the rescue in a desperate situation. A family redeemer might come in to uh, purchase somebody's freedom if they've been enslaved or if they've gone bankrupt. They might be the one who reclaims their family property to keep it in the clan. But it's somebody who's related to you and has a legal commitment to protect your interests. And Ruth simply says to Boaz, you're the one to redeem my situation. There is one little glitch here, a fly in the ointment. Boaz tells her there's somebody else who is closer and has the first legal right. So you're going to have to tune in next week to see what comes next. <clears throat> but Boaz is uh, decidedly willing and eager to spread his covering over Ruth, to marry this young Moabite woman, and to redeem her whole family situation. And in asking uh, Boaz to do this, interestingly, Ruth's words, spread your covering over me, harkens back to chapter 2, verse 12, where Boaz had seen the great kindness of Ruth and prayed that the Lord would reward her 
for showing that kindness because she had taken protection under the wings of the Lord. Well, in the Hebrew, the word for wings and the word for covering are the same word. In essence, Ruth is asking Boaz, will you be the answer to your own prayer? Will you be to me the blessing I need from God to redeem my whole family situation? And Boaz is more than ready. And in the night before sunrises, she will be gone home and he will be off to business to see if this family situation can be resolved before the next sunset. So chapter 3 is interesting. Uh, In chapter 3, like in much of the book of Ruth, God doesn't say anything. And God doesn't obviously do anything that you can clearly see. There are no miracles going on here that are obvious to the human eye. But what we do see behind the scenes unfolding in their lives is the quiet providence of God. A God who sees people in need, who cares about their circumstances, who recognizes their faithfulness and honors that in his own time and way. Uh, People who have problems, yes, absolutely. And a God who has plans, yes, absolutely. So will you trust the Lord in the ups and downs of your family life through the good and bitter events that we all face? Will you trust the Lord? Will you show faithfulness to Him believing that even in difficult circumstances, God is still faithful to you? Will you seek to live faithful to him and loyal to the people around you, to live to be a blessing to your family, to your friends, to your church, to your community? And through your kindness, through your commitment, be a living flesh and blood demonstration of the committed kindness of God our Father. Someone said that uh, things don't just work out. Rather, God works out things. And this midnight marriage proposal could have gone all wrong. But God was at work in it. As these two women made their plans, as Boaz made his decisions, the plans of God were working out slowly, one day at a time. Well, we started with... uh, marriage proposals of today, and we'll end with one last one. There was a man in the Netherlands whose name was withheld from media reports that I could find, but he wanted a big surprise for his fiancée-to-be. He hired a crane operator to park a crane outside her apartment building with the intent that the crane was going to lift him up and he would sing his marriage proposal outside her window. Well, the crane showed up, and as it was positioning itself outside the building, it tipped over and crashed into one of the apartments. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. Well, after an event like that, you'd think, well, things couldn't get any worse, but you'd be wrong because they had to bring in a larger crane to lift off the first crane, and in the process of doing that, they damaged Six more apartments. Unbelievable. Well, you would think that any potential bride-to-be might want to steer clear from anybody with that kind of luck. But instead, she said yes, and they got married anyway, in spite of a very tippy start to their relationship. Uh, For Ruth and for Naomi, some very serious things in life had tipped over. Uh, Their society and times that they lived in were very broken, and God's people, Israel, were not living like God's people very much or very well. They'd been through famine, Naomi had a relocation, then Ruth had a relocation, and they had both lost husbands. They had both lost their security. They had lost any sight of a better future ahead. But God was not done. And Ruth, in her commitment to Naomi and her commitment to come under, her, um, <clears throat> under the care and providence of God, came into a path that would eventually lead her to a new life and a blessing and being not only a vehicle of the kindness of God, but a recipient of it. He is a God who knows what he's doing, and his business is redemption. And what he wants to see in us 
in regards to him and to the people around us is a faithful, loyal love. And what he wants to see for us, what he wants to give to us, is his own faithful, loyal love for you and I. If you have never trusted him before, today would you tell him you need him? Would you tell him that you need a redeemer, you need a rescue, you need forgiveness of sin, you need eternal life, you need his guidance and direction in your life? And friend, if you're ready to trust him today, he is ready to go to work in your life as he has been behind the scenes already without you even knowing it. Let's pray. Uh, Father, this day in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, may we trust you. Uh, when things go wrong, when we get hurt, uh, when we have problems that seem to defy solution, may we look to you for your kindness and mercy, believing that you're not done with our story. And then, Lord God, may we have open eyes and an open heart to see where you want to use us to be the answer to somebody else's need, to somebody else's prayer. Because, Lord, you do have plans for all of us, and they are for good. And they are to be a good representation of your heart in the families and communities that we live in. Pray this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us today.